the, uh, the dust has settled after uh -huh. the beta, or the beta. <laughs> exactly, the beta. Um, what kind of lessons did you learn from that that you're going to take forward to the actual full retail version? Oh, I mean, what's interesting is the biggest lessons we learned are the ones that no one's going to see, which are all the sort of infrastructure and the matchmaking and dedicated servers and where they need to go around the world. Those sorts of things are the most important. That I think if we had gone out to on September 20th without having the beta, uh, it would have been it wouldn't have been as like Gears 2, but it certainly wouldn't it would have been as smooth as the beta, which we had lots of ups and downs along the way. Um, but we got all that stuff worked out, so I'm, I'm really excited for people to be able to get into it. But there's other stuff as well, like we found Thrashball and Trenches, two of our maps had spawn camping issues, so we altered those maps to allow for escape corridors, we tweaked some ranges and weapon power, and uh, we changed the, the duration of King of the Hill, that kind of stuff. So a lot of nudges, but the big thing was just how to do dedicated servers right. So you're raring to go for September now, the dedicated servers up to kind of top spec and all? Yeah. And all that. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Like I was saying, that if we didn't do the beta, I was going to have a sleepless night just because of what happened in Gears 2. I was going to have a sleepless night uh, on September 19th going like, oh my god, when a million people come to play multiplayer, what's going to happen? And now after the beta, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sleep easy on, on September 20th. Were you disappointed that the, the campaign leaked online? Oh, yeah, tremendously disappointed. I mean, from a bunch of different reasons. One is that it, it's an early build from way before even the beta, and so it doesn't represent the game at all. Um, I think the fact that people are trying to use that information to hurt other people's experiences by whether it be yelling it in a chat room or, or you know those sorts of things or, or tricking people to watch videos and stuff I, um, I, it's really disappointing and, you know because I always think I think of the gears community or and the gaming community in general as sort of a, a close-knit group or at least people who have the same interests and so for p griefers to want hackers to want to go out and try to ruin the other people's experiences is just terribly disappointing how does something like that affect the team back here? Uh, it's demoralizing. You know, when the leak happens, you just, you just it, 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 it caused like some people literally lost sleep over it just because it just it was really disappointing that because it's things too like you want surprises, you want people to have there's a sense of wonder in the game, and you want to be able to go and say, hey, there's this thing we're not showing you because we want it to be a secret, and then people go out and purposely try to exploit that, and and so you feel like you've lost. Imagine in the sixth sense if if somebody said, told, you know, oh, yelled from the top of every building, this is what they had. the the thing is that you, that that experience would have been lost on it for you, and, and whether you want it to be taken from you or not. So, yeah, it hurts a lot. But it must help the team to know that it's the most pre-ordered Xbox title in the history. Is that correct? Yeah, it's the most most pre-ordered exclusive. Exclusive. Yeah. So yeah, it's great. I mean, uh, to have that kind of momentum and interest in the game has been really exciting. And that's one of the nice things about the leak is in the sense that it was limited to Xbox. So it's not like a PC leak where everybody in the world is playing it. It's only people with modded Xboxes, and at least that's a subset. But. Yeah, I mean, we've put so much effort into this version. It's the biggest one we've ever done. It's the most polished one we've ever done. We're so proud of everything that's there. So to have see the response from the fans has been exciting. Have you found the source of the leak? Yes and no. I mean, we f we think we're pretty close to who did it, and uh, and so we're following all doing all the right legal things that we need to do. So um, how they exactly got it, we're not 100% sure yet. Um, I know what they say and what they what is true is not necessarily the same. So, uh, but we're doing all the right things legally. Ooh, <laughs> I'll give you a side of bacon for her though. Oh, bacon. Hey, take the deal, Cole. I haven't had bacon in six months. This time we got four player co-op in the campaign. Is it harder to balance something like that? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, four-player co-op changes the rules on everything. It's it, it hard to balance from a story perspective. It was a real challenge for Karen to be able to say, okay, I'm going to tell a story where there's always four characters in every scene. And how do, you, how do you do that in terms of dialogue and who gets to talk and all that kind of stuff. And then from a gameplay perspective, it's just you have four people all looking for cover, all wanting to attack the enemy. And so we had to go back to sort of a Gears 1 style where we created more combat bowls, these just bigger spaces where there's lots of cover and you can pick your own flanking routes and you can determine how you want to take the fight to the enemy. So it's kind of been great from a nostalgia point of view, going back and thinking of Embry Square and, and the types of ways that we, you played Gears 1 and you get to do that all over again in Gears 3. So a case of bigger maps, more enemies kind of thing to balance the... Well, yeah, well, we, we're not always a big fan of just putting more enemies in. So what we, tend, what we did is we t created the Lambent, the, that third army, and we made them a really tough enemy to help deal with the co-op aspect. So, and the fact that they can mutate up and change their arms, and they can actually shoot at multiple people at the same time, and they can shoot over cover to make you more vulnerable, and that kind of thing. And they're tougher in general, and they blow up when you get close to them. So that was kind of meant to sort of the counter that power of four people playing together. 
You've been going through a lot of these kind of exclusive unlockables. Uh -huh. Do you think that kind of it, it might have an adverse effect on the people that say didn't get a chance to buy the pizza and get the, the cold train, right. the skin and stuff like that? Yeah, it's 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 a double-edged sword. The exclusives are always a double-edged sword, and, and and part of it is that the people who really want that stuff are the people who would, who do the really crazy thing. People want us to give content only for for seriously people, and that's such a, that's like you know half a percent of our entire population, and so it's hard to create content for just that half a percent. So you always have to look at trying to find this this carrot that you want to have people to go after and encourage them to pre-order or go encourage them to play the beta. Um, but at the same time, you don't necessarily want to take content away from others. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a mixed bag. I think um, I think there's ways to solve it, but um, I mean, right now it's just that's what the beta was going to be the mo get its most value by getting people to play for as long as possible. And so we created the cold train one for just for that. What lessons did you learn from the Gears Two campaign that you've taken forward into three? Uh, I think one of the big lessons we fully felt was the that that sense of the bigger spaces as much as it was for four player co-op. But it was that we felt like Gears Two. A lot of people when we when we talked around about how people played it, it would tend to be lancer and long shot. It was a lot of sniper rifle play because it was a longer quarter. You know, you're dealing inside of a worm or you're inside of a cave. And one of the big changes actually in Gears Three that I'm, some people might be upset with is we actually treat the sniper rifle as a power weapon in Gears Three. So it, when you pick up ammo crates, you actually don't get sniper ammo from it. So that hoping to encourage people to get rid of the sniper rifle and, and pick up the boom shot and pick up other weapons. Have you already started planning for the future after Gears 3? No, we're really focused on, everybody's got blinders on and, and, and just getting Gears 3 out the door and having the most successful launch we can have. So, uh, you know, the industry's changing with mobile and social and, and everything else that's coming in the future. So we're just sort of taking our time and say, let's get focused on this and then we'll pop our head up the other side and see what's going on. Have you got a long kind of plan for, not, not DLC, but the community stuff that you're doing, the, the challenge weeks? Oh, sure. I mean, that's one of the things we wanted to have in Gears 3 was a lot more interaction with the fans on, on an event. You know, we do it now. I do is these Twitter XP weekends or weeks or whatever. And we actually changed from a message of the day in Gears 2 to a calendar in Gears of War 3 because we wanted to have that ability to have Ticker Tuesday and to have, you know, those kinds of, like, more regular events where you know that we're paying attention, we're listening, and, and we're being more interactive. Now, Gears of War, when it launched, was it 2006? Six, yeah. 2006. It was obviously a new IP from Epic. Mm -hmm. uh, Bulletstorm came out recently. I think Mike Cap said that it, it didn't break even, but they're still going to kind of put their, their resources into that, that the IP. How, how in this day and age do you, you kind of get a new shooter and a new IP to be successful like Gears of War? Uh, a new shooter in this day and age is really hard. Uh, there's such a you're going against there's such a body of work already out there that you're competing with. Like if you're trying to do a shooter today, you have to deal with, hey, we expect all these features that all these shooters have. So it's really tough. It's really tough. And that's why you have to find that thing, that hook that really dif differentiates it. And that's what the you know, People Can Fly tried to do with Bulletstorm was really give it that, oh, we'll, we'll make it a little bit more less realistic. We'll make it more tongue in cheek and having fun with it. So it's not about... Uh, it's, if you're tired of the realism and you want to find a fantasy with a, with a certain sense of humor, this is the place to go. And so that's kind of what, you know, it's the way we are with Gears too, is that we have monsters and we have third person and we have characters. We don't have just faceless people who you don't know the names of. These are people that you care about. And so that's how we're trying to define our niche. Have you ever complained some motion sickness to the camera when you're doing the road book? No, no, actually, no, we haven't had that much motion signal. The interesting thing is we had a role on the ship when we, while we were building Raven's Nest levels that you played today. Uh, we originally had a lot more sway in the camera and cans would roll and stuff like that. And yeah, that's when people were getting nauseous and we had to turn all that stuff way down.